Great. Well, uh, hi, everybody. I guess it's not morning anymore. I was going to say good morning, but we're at noon. Uh, thanks all for, for coming today. My name is Natalie Hennigan, and um, I'm an independent historian and researcher hired by the Cass Gilbert Society, um, in essence, to find missing pieces of furniture and fixtures from our state capitol building. Uh, the Cass Gilbert Society, just a little background here, uh, started about 20 years ago. We're based in St. Paul, um, but they do have membership nationwide, and their, their goal is essentially to um, enhance our general public appreciation for the architect Cass Gilbert, who of course designed our state capitol. Um, they do educational events, lectures, talks and tours, that sort of thing, um, all over the country uh, to, to visit some of Gilbert's designs. He did not work exclusively in Minnesota, although he spent a good chunk of his childhood and early career uh, in St. Paul. As I said, he's, he's almost Minnesotan. He was born in Zanesville, Ohio, um, and he moved to St. Paul with his family when he was nine years old. Um, as soon as he became a young adult interested in architecture, he moved out east and traveled widely through Europe as well. So he spent a good chunk of time in Italy and England and France, um, being very inspired by the turn of the century Renaissance revival um, architecture over there. Uh, he spent a year or so at uh, MIT studying architecture as well, um, and then got a job with McK the architecture firm of McKim, Mead & White out of New York City. He made his way back to St. Paul uh, and kind of managed the McKim, Mead and Whites, that's such a mouthful every time I say it, um, their uh, Western portfolio because really at the time Minnesota was, was the West. Um, and he built commercial buildings, homes, churches, railroad depots uh, throughout Minnesota and the Dakotas and out to Montana as well. Um, so the Cass Gilbert Society uh, in, in, in tracing some of Gilbert's work has taken trips out to Montana to see some of his, his depots. They've, they've taken the train, the Amtrak out there um, and seen some of his work. The Capitol Project, uh, Gilbert won that commission in 1896. Uh, he was only 35 years old and Minnesota was only 37 years old. So I like to think they kind of burst onto the national scene around the same age. Um, and it really is what propelled Gilbert's career forward after which he uh, went back out east and uh, designed some of our most notable, uh, oops, sorry, um, uh, civic political buildings as well. Uh, the Customs House, the Woolworth Building, widely considered the first real skyscraper uh, in New York City. A couple of their state capitals. Um, Gilbert never saw the completion of our Supreme Court building. He died in 19, uh, sorry, yeah, 1934. And his son finished up that project for him. I like this photo of Gilbert. This is in 1901 during the construction of the state capitol as the dome is being completed, looking out on St. Paul. <laughs> so why are we looking for furniture? Um, I think to understand the furniture of the building, it helps to understand the building itself. Um, this is our third capitol building. Our first and second capitol buildings were in downtown St. Paul um, at about 10th and Cedar. And there's a light rail station on top of that spot right now. <laughs> and um, the first building was destroyed by a fire in 1881. The second building was built on the same site in 1883. Um, but immediately people realized it was too small, really poorly ventilated. Um, and so almost immediately plans were in the works for a real true uh, big enough capital building. As I said, uh, Gilbert won the commission in 1896 uh, over about 40 entries. Um, he, was, he was really politically savvy and kind of, you know, I wouldn't say pulled some strings, but had the right connections, I think, to make that happen. It was his first real, true, you know, big, um, notable commission like this. So uh, it was a big step forward for him. As I said, he was very much inspired by the Italian Renaissance, um, the Beaux-Arts style of architecture. He had um, notably spent time at the um, Chicago World's Fair of 1893. And the whole city beautiful concept is definitely apparent, I think, in the architecture of our, uh, of our state capital. It cost four and a half million dollars to construct which is about what it costs to restore the artwork with our most latest restoration of the building. <laughs> Just for a little comparison. Um, but the furniture uh, and, and all the interior fixtures were intended to complement Gilbert's exterior design. He was very particular about everything that filled the building, from the furniture to the light fixtures to the carpet to the curtains, um, the ironwork, the marble, everything. He had a voice in making those decisions. Um, the, I'm not an architect, but uh, drawings like this just kind of make me drool. This is his, of course, drawing of the, of the dome. After St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, our state capital dome is the second largest self-supporting dome in the world. Um, and of course, Gilbert would have seen St. Peter's during his travels uh, through Italy and took some of that inspiration back home with him. 
A little bit of background about the furniture itself. So Gilbert would have designed or selected 1,600 pieces of furniture for the capital. Um, and we'll get into a bit about which ones he, he actually designed himself and which ones he selected uh, from you know, existing furniture manufacturers at the time. Um, in 1969, the Minnesota Historical Society uh, started operating the Capitol as a historic site and giving tours. And, and that also meant that everything inside the building became a part of the Historical Society's collection. So they numbered it, they inventoried it, um, and, it and it has been you know, used and taken care of as they would any other artifact of their collection. But it wasn't until 1989 that the first real thorough inventory of furniture happened. Up until that point, uh, site managers in the state had done um, not very thorough, I guess, uh, surveys of the furniture. They might have done just whatever existed in the House of Representatives chambers or certain offices, but that was the first time we really went through and saw, did a, did a, a, a thorough sweep of the furniture. And that's when they discovered that about 800 pieces of furniture remained in the building, which sounds like a lot had left, right? Almost half. Um, in fact, we've learned that this is about, this is probably the greatest uh, percentage of furniture retained in the capital throughout the United States. A lot of state capitals, you know, no longer have a, a much larger chunk of, of their furniture, especially if it was built, you know, around the same time as ours, almost 100, or about 110 years ago. Over the course of this project, um, I've been on the job here for about, nine months, I guess, uh, we found almost 40 pieces of furnishings, for, or pieces of furniture. We have no numerical goal of, of what, we, what we should find. Um, really, it's a, it's a matter of trying to record where some things have gone, trying to trace patterns, too, of when furniture left, where it was going, um, who was interested in getting it, I guess, and then telling the stories of the furniture and who owns it now um, and uh, you know, where they've lived. And th things have popped up truly all over the country. So what's the point? Um, I've been asked this a lot, and I've been trying to grapple with this too. What's the point of finding missing pieces of furniture from the state capitol? Um, I, I can come up about it a couple different ways. Because Gilbert designed or selected and had such a, a specific view of what the furnishings should look like, I think it is important for us to get you know, as, as, as good a sense as we can of what the building looked like in 1905. Um, here's a photo of the house retiring room that was taken right as the building opened. Um, it's important, I think, to, to you know, understand traditions of managing buildings like this too, and understanding um, when when things have left and how they left. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's about telling the stories, uh, because the chair from the state capitol has had uh, innumerable decisions made while sitting in it, um, and innumerable owners too, just during its life in the capital. And then once it leaves the capital, um, it's taken up a life in somebody's living room or private office or um, you know. A local hist county historical society, for example. And so it's been really exciting for me personally to, to get to know some of the people who have incorporated pieces of furniture or fixtures into their personal collection and treat it like a family heirloom because in many cases it is. Um, I like to think that the, the furniture you know, is kind of like a piece of the building itself and, and that this project can hopefully emphasize that uh, we all as Minnesotans have, have a connection, um, physical or not, to, to the building itself. Um, and so I'm going to dive into some of these stories. A note real quick about the naming conventions of, of some of the furniture that we've found. Um, most of the items either have uh, letters or numbers in front of them. So the DD swivel chair, for example, is this chair right here. Um, I, I, I don't have documentation or any understanding of why Gilbert chose the letters and numbers he did. But I do know that uh, letters indicated furniture that he designed himself. So he sketched this out and he designed this chair. Um, when it comes to furniture that has a number in front of it, like the 573 chair over here, this is something that Gilbert would have selected from a, a furniture manufacturer at the time. So this chair, I'll show you a couple examples of this that we found was um, uh, built by a manufacturing company out of Ohio, and they would have uh, constructed, you know, made similar chairs like this at the time already. So the DD swivel chair, <clears throat> there were 191 of these originally ordered, and there were so many because these were the chairs that legislators sat in in the House of Representatives and Senate chambers. This is a photo, again from 1905, right when the building opened, that was published in Western Architect. Um, Western Architect was uh, a, a popular na nationwide um, architectural catalog magazine of sorts that would showcase the latest and greatest you know, um, 
construction of the time. And uh, they did this huge big spread of the Minnesota State Capitol when it opened, um, which, was, which was pretty unique because like I said, Minnesota was kind of on, on the frontier still at that point. Um, and, to, and for an, a young architect with um, very Eastern and European influenced styles to you know, build this building way out <laughs> west um, was a pretty big deal. I, uh, I heard, this is kind of a tangent, but I heard a story about uh, one of the murals that Gilbert commissioned for the Capitol. Uh, and he commissioned it by a, a, from a New York artist. And so it was on display in New York before it was shipped out to St. Paul and installed here. And uh, you know, somebody commented to the artist that, oh, this is beautiful. It's a shame it's going out to Minnesota where nobody will see it. <laughs> I thought it was funny because obviously we, uh, we made our mark soon enough. Um, Anyway, so the DD swivel chair, 191 of these. Um, by the time that inventory happened in the late 80s, over half of them had disappeared. Um, and this is for one big reason, and it's the same reason that a lot of stuff has disappeared. It's that the attitude in the 1970s was throw it away and start over. Um, and in 1970, uh, the House of Representatives went through a huge redecoration. They got rid of all the chairs. They covered the desks with Formica. They installed some really great red carpet. Um, and they offered up to uh, legislators who were in office at the time the option to buy their chair. And I think they could buy it for about 10 or $15. Um, as you can imagine, lots of people took them up on this offer. Here's an image of the Senate. Senate chairs, for some reason, were able to stay. So those are the, still the originals. Here's the Senate in 1905. Uh, in their chairs. So this has been the number one thing that I found. I think we've uncovered, uncovered like eight or nine of these chairs over the, uh, uh, all across Minnesota that had been purchased by their lo a legislator in office at the time around 70, 71. Um, some of these chairs live you know, in private homes. Some of them were taken home uh, by the legislator and then donated to their local historical society. Um, this one, for example, was uh, L.J. Lee's chair, and he was a, a, a legislator from Clearwater County, just west of Bemidji. Uh, so he then donated his chair to the Historical Society. Yesterday I was at the Nobles County Historical Society, and they have a chair um, that their uh, local legislator, John Olson, had sat in and purchased and then, and then donated along with his desk, actually. Um, the desk itself was uh, an addition to the Capitol in the 30s. And um, so it wasn't an original Gilbert design, but still uh, was from the Capitol. And also just as disposable, I guess, they were getting rid of a bunch of them. Here's an image of a senator here in his DD swivel chair in 1911. So a lot of folks, like I said, have come to me saying, I have this chair uh, from the Capitol. My father or grandfather was a legislator and, and bought it. Um, and, and this is a list, not the complete list, I guess, of, of uh, representatives who had uh, taken their chairs home. This is a nice image of post-renovation. I wish I had a color version of the photo, because like I said, the carpet is just like screaming red. Um, from 1973. The funny thing about the chairs is that they were replaced with nearly identical chairs. Um, the one caveat was that the new chairs had five legs instead of four. And I heard from more than one person that the four leg chairs were a little too unstable for some politicians who might get a little too comfortable, lean a little too far back, and actually topple out of their chair. So this was a daughter of a legislator told me that this was a source of humor, I guess, regularly um, pre-1970. Um, unfortunately, they are not afforded that anymore. But uh, anyway, so, so almost identical chairs now are in the House of Representatives. Um, yeah, and so we found seven. I think that's, a, that's I, I, there, we came across one uh, recently in the last couple of weeks, so I need to update it to eight. But I was at an estate sale a couple of weeks ago in a diner just west of Minneapolis where um, a widow of a legislator was selling uh, her husband's chair, her DD swivel chair. Um, any guesses what it sold for? I had no idea what it would, it was $300. And it was actually, which I was actually surprised by because the, surprised how much it was because the leather was kind of torn, it needed some work, you know? Um, but it was purchased by a woman uh, about my age who uh, works at the state capitol now, and she's a tour guide there. So she thought it was pretty cool to take home a piece of, of her workplace history. <laughs> um, next chair we'll talk about is the 1087 chair. 
Um, so again, with the number, one of those that Gilbert would have purchased and selected from, from a furniture manufacturer and not designed himself. Yeah. What's that? Just, yeah. If there's 80 of them left, mm -hmm. where are they? I mean, how do they use them in the Capitol? Sure. So most of those are still in the Senate because the Senate chambers still have the originals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so two 1087 chairs live in the Folsom House, which is a Minnesota Historic Society historic site in uh, Taylor's Falls, so right on the St. Croix River. And it's this beautiful house uh, up on the hill in, a, in the Angel Hill District with lots of colonial looking houses like this. Um, two of these chairs are in the dining room of the Folsom House. <clears throat> and Folsom, W.C. Folsom, uh, was a local lumber baron and state politician. He died in 1900. Um, but this was his house. The Folsom family uh, left most of their furniture in the house, but took some of it with them, so that when the Minnesota Historical Society acquired the building and began operating it as a historic site in the 60s, uh, they needed some furniture to, to fill it out. So th there's no documentation of this, but site managers are pretty sure that uh, because at the time, um, capital furniture was, was part of the Historical Society's collections already, that site managers or interpreters might have just shuffled some chairs from the Capitol from St. Paul over to the Folsom House to fill out the dining room. Um, at first, so you'll notice it's kind of hard to see, but it says State of Minnesota and a number on it. So clearly state property at some point. Um, initially, site managers thought, oh, maybe this was a gift to Folsom. He was a state senator. He worked at the Capitol. Maybe it was a gift when he retired or something like that. Um, later on, people realized that uh, these were from the 1905 Capitol. Folsom had died by then. When he was a senator, he worked in one of those or first or second state capital. He never even saw these chairs. Um, so so, so the, the, the thinking now is that this was a, a site management decision to move some stuff from collections over, over to uh, Taylor's Falls. So these chairs have been recovered. They would have been uh, leather seats. Most of the furniture was oak uh, with leather. Um, covers. So they've been recovered with some floral fabric now. Um, a note about the, the markings. As I said, it wasn't until the late 80s that that first real inventory happened and we had a, a standardized way of marking it. Um, but prior to that, some furniture would have been printed with State of Minnesota and one of these inventory numbers. And that might have happened in the 60s. Um, other furniture might have had these brass tags on it, which was probably one of the first ways of marking and inventorying the furniture that probably happened in the 20s or 30s. Not all furniture has one or both of these. Some of them have both, some of them have none. Um, if it does have a, one of these marks, it's, it's pretty clear that it is from the Capitol, um, but it's not a guarantee that the furniture will have it. So. Um, found another pair of these chairs in South St. Paul, Again, recovered with a different floral pattern. Um, and the woman who owns these now purchased them at an auction about 25 years ago. She's a, a, a regular furniture collector, auction goer, um, and found these. She's a local history lover. And so when she learned they were from the Capitol, because of course they do have this number and a state of Minnesota mark on them. When she learned they were from the Capitol, she thought, hey, this would be kind of cool to take home a piece of, of state local history. Um, she says they're not very comfortable, so they sit around her dining room table, maybe only for, or only for necessity. Um, so in 1905, Gilbert ordered 75 of these. Only 18 remained in the building uh, in 1989, and so we found four uh, over the course of the last year. The 573 chair is this one over here. And uh, 573, like the 1087, would have been, uh, would have filled offices throughout the Capitol, not in the chambers, but um, some of the more private offices. Uh, 173 originally ordered, so it's a pretty common chair. Um, 87 left in 89. We found four over the course of this project. One that's in gorgeous condition is in St. Paul. Again, um, a, a, a furniture lover, antique furniture lover, um, has it in his home right now. He actually inherited it from his brother after his brother passed away. The brother had purchased it at a rummage sale in, in Minneapolis. Um, so who knows? if he's the third or the fourth owner you know, of, of this chair. Um, he recovered it when he, when he got it. He said it was kind of torn up. The leather was kind of torn up. But it sits in his foyer right now, and he said his kids do their homework in the chair and sit at that desk, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, this might have been what the chair looked like when he 
acquired it. This is a trio of the 573 chairs um, that are in, in Minneapolis. Again, an auction find. Uh, the, the folks who got in touch with me about, about these chairs, I think they were a little confused about the project. They, they thought I could uh, reupholster them. They, they thought they, they could they could off them off to me and I could said, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's on you. But um, hopefully they can at some point because they are really solid chairs. Um, you'll see another brass tag up on this one in the corner. And then this tag says comptroller. So um, of all the offices in the Capitol, we might have an idea of where that one might have sat um, based on old you know, floor plans and that sort of thing. This is a very similar chair, but a, uh, a little rarer. Only 38 of these chairs. This is called the 573 and a half. So um, the, the swivel is, is the main uh, difference here. And we found one of these um, at, the, at the Department of Human Services uh, building, which is downtown St. Paul, actually right across the street from where our, old, our first and second capitals lived. And it's funny to think how, uh, you know, in 1905, this was a very common standard office chair, and now it sticks out like a sore thumb in this, you know, very modern 10-year-old building with uh, lots of gray plastic cubes and, and all that. Um, but the woman who, who owns it or has the chair in her office uh, has worked for the Department of Human Services for about 25, 30 years. Um, and, and years ago, when their offices were going through a big remodel, uh, she found the chair in an empty office and, and kind of looked around, asked around, didn't know if anybody wanted it. And she she kind of got the go ahead and took it for herself. And uh, nobody objected, I guess. And she, uh, she's had it through a couple different office moves and remodels since then. Um, and she adores it. So uh, it's, been, it's been fun with, with all of these that I've showed you so far. Um, you know, the people who, who own these chairs are, are very, um, they're happy to have, you know, a piece of the capital and they care for these chairs, you know, like, maybe even more than they would, you know, and just their, their normal uh, office chair or um, chair in their living room. Uh, this woman w was very adamant that, you know, that she's going to find a good owner for it when she retires or <laughs> um, somebody's going to make sure that th that, that person's going to take care of it um, when she no longer needs it. Oops. This isn't working anymore. My battery might be out on this, sorry. Might have to do it by hand. Okay, um, next is the end work table, which, uh, oh, now it's going. Okay, um, so it's not just chairs that we found, uh, tables too, I guess. Um, the end work table is kind of unique because Gilbert designed this table, but uh, left some leniency when, when uh, it was it went to be manufactured. Uh, this is his drawing here, and this says tables to be made, or tables to be with and without drawers. So some of the tables had these three drawers, some of them didn't. Some of them had four drawers. Um, and then the length and the width varied. He made a hundred of these for the capital, so they were, they were meant to fit, uh, you know, various office sizes and such. Um, this photo behind is uh, of the Minnesota Senate Railroad Committee in 1909 around one of these end work tables. It's a very simple table, um, but it's probably unique de defining feature is the, uh, the curved stretchers here on the bottom. I was, uh, this is maybe one of the most exciting or unexpected finds of, of the project. I was meeting with the project directors who are two uh, board members of the Cass Gilbert Society. And one of them, Carolyn, is a former site manager at the state capitol, and she was part of that big inventory in the late 80s. Um, so she knows the furniture very well, very thoroughly. And I was meeting with her and John, the other project director at a coffee shop in St. Paul, um, not far from downtown. And uh, it's, it's this old commercial building, and, and downstairs on the lower level, they have, you know, it's a bit quieter for, for meeting and, and that sort of thing. They have couches and all sorts of tables, and we're walking downstairs, and Carolyn stops, and she says, oh, that's a capital table. <laughs> I said, what? And we, we were walking into this coffee shop, and one of these end work tables was, was sitting there. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, it's kind of dark, but uh, this is the table um, in the coffee shop. And uh, here's the brass tag, and of course, the, the stretchers on the bottom. I'm sorry, these are so dark. Uh, Anyway, it was, it was fascinating to be meeting about this project to find capital furniture at a piece of capital furniture. Um, and Carolyn herself, when she worked at the Capitol, had worked at one of these, at one of these tables. Um, so that was kind of fun. 
We've since met there several times. It seemed like the only appropriate place to meet. Um, the owner of the coffee shop, the reason she had it in the first place, uh, she opened the coffee shop about six years ago and had searched estate sales and antique stores to find furniture to fill the coffee shop. And um, she's been a long, she's a long time St. Paul resident and she found this table at an estate sale in Cathedral Hill near her home in St. Paul. And so she's excited to find it locally. Um, I haven't figured out if the house where she found it was maybe the home of a former legislator or not. Um, so I'm not sure if Mary, the owner, is you know, the second or third maybe owner of the, of the table. But um, it fits well in that space, that's for sure. Um, then I was at the Capitol a couple weeks later, and uh, there's this really cool Lego model of the Capitol sitting on an end work table. So um, while everyone was ogling at the Legos, I'm like, oh, that's, that's a table I know about. So, <laughs> um, as, as I said, there, there were 100 of these originally, just originally made, 35 are still left in the building at least. Um, so they, they are, are used for a wide variety of reasons throughout the building. Um, a note about uh, the manufacturer itself, the um, Bone Manufacturing Company made the N work table, which is a St. Paul company, and it's one of the few local companies that, uh, that Gilbert actually used for, for um, furnishing the capital. Um, Bone eventually went, went on to make uh, refrigerator products and then was acquired by Whirlpool. Um, but uh, but to, to sort of take a pause from the furniture, Gilbert was, um, maybe not the most popular for his choices in where he, he purchased material from. As you might know, um, he was adamant that we use Georgia marble for the exterior of the building. And if you've seen it since the restoration, it is truly gleaming white. It is, it is gorgeous. Um, and, he, and he made sure that we did it. But of course, we have a lot of cool local stone in Minnesota and stonemasons that needed to be put to work, right? And uh, so, so people were kind of upset that Gilbert was so um, determined to, to import uh, this nice stone. Um, he did try to appease folks by using um, St. Cloud granite for the, the, the foundation on the exterior, um, but, but got his way with the Georgia marble. Um, the the, the, some of the chairs that I showed you before were made by a company out in Ohio. Um, he subcontracted to this uh, a furniture company called Herter Brothers out in New York City to make some of the furniture. But Bone Manufacturing made this table. I think that's one of the only things they actually created for the, for the capital. And then this cool wardrobe um, was made by Stillwater Manufacturing Company. Uh, we haven't come across these, any of these in our search, but only about a quarter of the original order remain in the capital. And they are used regularly in um, offices and meeting rooms. Um, a couple of them aren't in the greatest shape and are, are in storage at the Minnesota Historical Society. They do kind of try to take care of stuff that um, hasn't been restored or needs to be restored um, before being used. So, The Stillwater Manufacturing Company also made uh, these sign posts. And I'm sorry I don't have better pictures, but I haven't actually been able to see this, see this one in person. This was just brought to my attention by an antique dealer in St. Cloud. Um, he found it at a rummage sale, so that's where these photos are from. Um, and then recently, uh, it's going to go to auction next week, I think. Um, and, and he's going to keep, I, I, I wish I could go to, just to see the auction, but I, I can't, unfortunately. Um, but he's going to keep me posted on how, how much it goes for. I have no idea what it'll be. But um, so this would have been, I, I think the originals had iron bases and then an oak um, stand uh, with, you know, signage where it would have posted announcements and directions or that sort of thing. Um, this is actually quite rare uh, because only about four of the originals remain in the capital, four of about like 25 to 30. And um, about 10 reproductions were made in the 80s, which you'll see all over the building now if you go visit. Um, they're on, on the stairs telling you not to like linger on the stairs, keep moving, or <laughs> keep moving through the building, um, that sort of thing. So, and they're about five feet tall, it says, almost five feet tall. If you go to Stillwater today, on the north end of downtown, you'll see the Stillwater Manufacturing Company. Um, now it says Isaac Staples Sawmill on it. That was a later iteration of the building. Um, and now there's an antique mall in it, I think. So uh, the goal of this project was not just to find um, pieces of furniture, but uh, other fixtures and fragments, which is a very, it's sort of a catch-all category, right? It could be um, light fixtures or old curtains or doorknobs or ironwork, that sort of thing. And um, un unlike the furniture, it's, it's, uh, it's not something you can Google, right, you can have, a good, have a good picture of. So anything that came to us in this category kind of came as a surprise, um, including a bunch of original windows from the state capitol. 
Uh, the windows of the building, there are 242 windows. They've only been replaced twice in the building's history. Once in about 74, 75, the original wood windows were replaced with aluminum. And then again in 2012, uh, with this late, latest restoration of the building, that was one of the projects. When the, uh, when the wood windows were replaced with aluminum, um, the, uh, the attorney general at the time, Warren Spanis, uh, was adamant that his wood windows remain in his office. Um, and so he got his way. And there are four original windows in the attorney general's office still to this day uh, that then the architect architectural team with the latest restoration used as models for recreating wood windows uh, during the 2012 replacement. So this particular type, these are all, this is the sketches. This was um, a recent markup, but um, based on Cass Gilbert's drawings. Like I said, there were 242 windows total. Um, and this type D window, uh, I think there are about 50 of them. And those would have been in first floor offices. A couple, uh, about two dozen of the type D windows actually live on a farm in Stanchfield, Minnesota right now, which is about an hour north of St. Paul. I was contacted by a woman who lives on this property. And she said that her uncle John was uh, part of the crew that re replaced the windows in the 70s. And when he was on the job, he learned that all the windows were going to be thrown out. And he said, well, can I take some home? Um, nobody cared. And so he did. And he loaded up his truck with some windows and brought them back to their barn. Um, since then, I'm fairly confident most of them have just been sitting in the barn since then. Uh, but uh, his niece, who then moved to the property, uh, it's been family land for a long time, um, she found these windows and when doing some remodeling work in the farmhouse actually installed four of these windows huge windows in the farmhouse and um so this is kind of dark but it's a huge window so it's hard to avoid the light um she and she's a, an artist and a collector and so had a lot of plants and things everywhere but uh this is one of the windows in her house it's like five feet wide and so she has these huge picture windows <laughs> essentially all over her farmhouse I got to go visit her and see these. Then she took me up the road to her parents' property, about a half mile down the road. And when they built this garden shed of sorts, they also installed some of the windows, just took them out of the barn and put them in here. As you can see, this would have been the top sash with the, with the curved glass there, um, which I thought was kind of cool, kind of a neat way to, to reuse. Um, as I said, they've returned to wood windows in the building now. But if you go and you see, if you, even from the exterior, you can see uh, on the Attorney General's office, they look kind of different still. They're, they're not quite the same. But. Another avenue we've gone down unexpectedly for this project is to find some of the original work of Daniel Chester French. So sculptor at the turn of the century, perhaps the most famous, of course, for Abraham Lincoln, the seated figure of the president in the Lincoln Memorial. Um, Daniel Chester French worked, lived and worked out of the Boston area and his home and studio called Chesterwood um, is now a historic site in the library and archive uh, for all of his work. <clears throat> he worked regularly with, with Cass Gilbert on a couple projects including the state capitol. Um, they were actually also working on uh, uh, the, the U.S. Customs House at the same time. French would design sculptures um, that, that often graced a lot of you know, civic buildings. Um, and so the Capitol, of course, is no exception. He designed this quadriga, the sort of gilded chariot and four horses that sits right at the base of the dome. Uh, he also designed six virtues, which are these figures, kind of hard to see, but below the quadriga there. Um, the six virtues are six uh, human figures representing the virtues, um, integrity, courage, bounty, truth, prudence, and something else that'll come to me, I promise. <laughs> um, and so there are two, two male figures and four female figures. The two male figures are integrity and courage, naturally, um, and the other four are, are um, women. And so the, the, the thing about these, these models is that French from Boston would have created half-size plaster models. Um, half-size means about five feet, because these things are about 10 feet tall. And shipped them out to St. Paul, and then local sculptors would carve uh, the, the actual full-size sculptures out of marble. Um, the ones that exist on the building today were actually reproductions made in the 70s once the originals had, had deteriorated. Um, so anyway, the original plaster models are, are quite are interesting because they're French's original creation, right? And as you can see here, you know, here he is obviously with not a full-size version of Lincoln. Um, 
So we found, uh, we're trying to, trying to find, you know, where these might have gone. We learned for a while that a uh, couple of them lived locally in St. Paul. They were in art galleries and then ended up being sold out east or to other galleries. Um, so we thought it might be interesting to see uh, where some of these went. And this is Truth here, and she lives at the Art Institute in um, Chicago. And this is Wisdom, and Wisdom lives at the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, these two, it's kind of interesting. It, it feels like these virtues have, have lived their lives in pairs almost. Truth and Wisdom uh, f were donated to the St. Paul Institute of Arts and Science in about 1912 by an architect who was an assistant of Gilbert. So, so we presume maybe that they were given, Gilbert gave them to, to this architect who then um, passed them along, uh, you know, so they could be um, maybe on display more for the public at the Institute of Arts and Science, which no longer exists. Um, then they moved to the Minnesota Museum of American Art, and then they moved to a private gallery in St. Paul. From there, they dispersed and were sold. Um, and uh, they are now in permanent collections at the Art Institute and Boston Athenaeum, respect respectively, um, and have been uh, on display, you know, for, I think for, um, in, in Boston, they did done some retrospective about, about French's work, and um, in Chicago recently, uh, she was on display as well. Um, so it, those are in, in permanent collections, probably won't ever make their way back to St. Paul, but through this process, we also uh, found some, some correspondence between Gilbert and French, and as I said, he was, he was pretty nitpicky. He was, he was very involved in the decisions of all of his subcontractors and um, people he hired, and so um, it's kind of fun to read some of his uh, requests. French was worried that truth might be too naked for public opinion, and he said, do not hesitate to say so, but of course, truth is supposed to bear all, so. Um, Anyway, I thought that was kind of fun to reread. I also uncovered, uncovered, I guess, we, we um, were, were shown some photos of the virtues themselves being installed, which is kind of neat, not only to see how, how big they are, you know, compared to, to these guys installing them, but also you can see, you know, the bluffs in St. Paul, what was there, I guess, in, in, this was in 1901, July 1901, these were being installed. This one here is Bounty, I think. She has a baby and um, like a cornucopia of sorts in her arms. Then I found uh, some insurance documentation from 1901-ish. From and this is a document, it's hard to read, but it's um, insuring for $1,500 the plaster models known as Courage and Integrity. As I mentioned, those were the two men. This is the only insurance documentation I found of the virtues. And I've been studying history long enough to know that you can learn almost just as much from what doesn't exist as what exists. And so I don't know how much to read into the fact that we don't have insurance documentation for any of the women, but um, I'm trying, <laughs> um, I think it's kind of funny that that's, that's maybe they're showing some value perhaps more to the, I don't know, I'm, I might be making that up, but, um, but that just kind of uh, made me laugh. Maybe they were coming in waves into St. Paul, and so they had to <laughs> do it, do it um, separately. I'm not sure. So, so we'll see what else we can what else we can track down. Um, it would be neat, of course, to find models of the the quadriga itself, which is so notable. And and now with the restoration, it's been regilded, and you can see it for miles practically. It really shines. Um, uh, so we'll see what else comes of that. But uh, the fun part was too. I got to go to the Minnesota Historical Society's. Um, off-site storage facility where they do keep a lot of, of items from the Capitol, stuff that needs to be restored, stuff that probably won't ever be used if it's one of a kind, one, one, the one item of furniture or thing that's, that's left. Um, but I did find, and this looks kind of weird, it looks kind of like a cemetery of plaster heads, but um, both the original uh, marble sculptures and then plaster models that were created in the 70s when the, when the, the reproductions were made of all of the virtues. So um, here, I think this is Courage, the warrior with his helmet. Um, this would have been Bounty with her baby. This was the original head for, I think, either Prudence, maybe, um, one of the women. And Integrity with his nose shaved off. Um, so it was kind of kind of neat to go, uh, to go you know, um, see some of these some of these items, they have, like I mentioned, those wardrobes made by the Stillwater Manufacturing Company, a couple of those that, that have you know, been, been used well, I guess, over the last few years. Um, some original light fixtures that they've reproduced, in addition to um, some one-of-a-kind uh, items. So some of the things that you know, we haven't come across over the course of this project include uh, this writing chair, which is an adorable little chair with some decoration in the back. Only eight of these were made originally. 
and the one remaining lives in that offsite uh, storage facility, in part because it is so rare. It's also pretty, you know, small and rickety, and um, wouldn't want anything bad to happen to that one remaining, a one of eight. Um, this couch here, uh, there are only 16 of these made and seven have been lost. And this chair up here, I wrote it down, 24 were made and only 13 still exist. So um, examples of, of styles too that we haven't come across that have been um, you know, less obvious to track down. And it's, and it's hard to say you know, if, if stuff like this, once the leather tore or whatever, if they were just thrown out, or um, if you know, sold off at auction, they've just totally you know, dispersed. Um, this right here is, it became sort of unexpectedly the holy grail of this, of this project. This is an image of the first floor elevator, uh, which when you walk up the, the stairs of the Capitol into the rotunda, you kind of turn around to your right. This is where this would have been, uh, right outside the current information desk in Minnesota Historical Society uh, office there. And um, so Gilbert would have designed these glass doors, beautiful glass doors, with uh, decorative ironwork on each of the panels. In 1970, uh, again, they were removed and uh, essentially thrown away. Um, they were replaced with uh, very basic, boring, stainless steel 70s elevator enclosure. Um, and even this top window up here was, was removed. With the latest restoration, the design team thought, wouldn't it be cool to sort of bring this back and recreate it? Well, unfortunately, this blurry backlit photo is the only documentation anyone's ever been able to find of what this elevator looked like, which sounds crazy, right? But we've also been trying to search for this. <laughs> I've been, you know, we've been trying to uh, go through the Minnesota Historical Society's archives. The New York Historical Society has all of Cass Gilbert's papers. Um, and a lot of information and correspondence related to the Capitol building. Um, they've gone through their stuff and nobody can find anything about what this looked like. Um, we have the mechanical drawing to the elevator, um, but not the design. So the latest restoration has recreated in a very, I think, historically you know, sympathetic way, the glass doors and, and this top window too, and it looks beautiful, um, but the ironwork was a little too detailed to, to, try, and, to try and recreate. It was kind of outside the scope of, of the project. Um, the ironwork itself was made by Flower City Ornamental Ironworks, which was another one of the few uh, local local companies commissioned. Um, this was a building, it is a building still in South Minneapolis. Flower City now exists as Flower City International and they're in Kentucky right now. But um, so here's this little map I have of where this, of where this iron work has gone. Um, so it started in Flower City, and Flower City, I should say, designed a lot of stuff for the Capitol. They did a lot of the railings and fences, if you're like kind of overlooking this, the grand staircases, um, lots of, most of the, the, the iron work for the, for the building. Um, installed here, and when it was uh, brought, when this was brought to my attention by the Casco Birth Society board and the project directors saying, wouldn't it be cool if we could find where this ironwork went or any drawings? Um, I said, yes, it would. But having learned that so much stuff was, was thrown away or given away or auctioned off um, in this time frame, I was very skeptical that um, some ironwork would actually turn up. Well, I was, in t I, was got I was in contacted, I should say, by a woman named Sandra right here. And Sandra was a tour guide at the Capitol in the early 70s while she was a student at the University of Minnesota. And Sandra said, my boss, Diana, who was um, the educational supervisor, you could say, uh, at the Capitol, she said, I remember Diana buying the ironwork that was removed from the elevator in about 1970 and taking it home to her, her house. I said, well, that's cool. Um, she said, I don't remember Diana's last name. I don't know anything about her. <laughs> but if you can find her, she might have it. Uh, I was able to find Diana through records at the Historical Society and the Capitol because she was on staff there. Um, got in touch with her. Turns out she and her husband, this is a map of Wayzata, uh, west, a western suburb of Minneapolis. Um, she and her husband, Tom, had this ironwork, this decorative ironwork, which I still like, had, had a hard time visualizing what it even looked like, right? Um, they took it home and had it in their house as, as decoration, I guess, um, only for a couple years. When they were uh, moving to a new house after having a couple of kids, uh, they sold off the ironwork to a man named Wells who owned uh, a clothing store called Anthony's. Anthony's was a, a boutique men's clothing store 
in Bloomington, so south, is, south of the cities, uh, in this groovy A-frame building here um, that had been like a bar and a music club, and then it was the clothing store, and then it was an antique mall, and now it's a Walmart, not, not in that building. It's been torn down, of course, but there's a Walmart there. Um, and uh, so he had then this iron work in the shop, in, in his store, uh, to, to, for use as, as like a display thing, you know, for ties or hats or something like that. Um, I spoke with him, and, and, and he's, you know, long retired, of course, and um, couldn't recall, you know, how much, he how much he purchased for, exactly what it looked like, but he remembered them being, the ironwork being um, several panels, maybe about a foot wide each, and he remembered them having lady slippers, so the state of Minnesota flower on them, which makes sense because uh, throughout the building there's a lot of Minnesota-specific, uh, you know, decoration or references, you could say, and other ironwork along the railings too has has some lady slippers on it so that makes sense um he then sold the ironwork to uh a man who I, I have yet to track down or yet to yet to sort of find anything about um i have his name though and his company but uh in the mid 90s when anthony's closed down um so so it's one of those things that i don't know if we're going to find it anywhere by the time this project wraps up in January. Um, but the fact that it has sold twice uh, gives me some hope that it is a value to somebody um, and that it, it might still exist out there. As I said, we're trying to, trying to kind of come at it from two angles, both find the, the piece itself and drawings of it. Um, there's nothing in the, historical, the Minnesota Historical Society archives, unfortunately, and, and um, were we to get another grant to do more research, we might take a trip out to New York to really do some dive into the Historical Society there um, and, and see what could come up. But uh, anyway, it's, it's been interesting so far, at least, to figure out, uh, to, to know that it has traveled this far. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So I'm still, at, uh, I'm still uncertain about what's going to come up, but we'll see. So. Um, I'm, I left some time for questions, I guess. I don't know, I'm leaving you hanging with the ironwork, but maybe if you, if you talk to me in February, I might, have, I might have some more answers. But um, does anybody have any questions about what we found or what You're the project? The oh, that's in my garage. Yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> yeah. When you find this, and you're keeping track of where yeah. it is, this isn't about bringing it back to the capital. Correct. So what exactly is that law? Correct, yes. Thanks for asking that. I should have mentioned that earlier. Because you're right, the goal is not to, to reacquire anything. Um, it's both outside the scope of the project and um, not really necessary, too. You know, in a way that there's been a lot of reproductions made and there's no shor furniture shortage in the capital. Um, but our goal will be creating a website that will live on the Cass Gilbert Society's website, existing website. Um, at kind of a, a virtual museum of sorts. All, all the photographs I've taken, stories we've collected, um, you know, map of, of where all this stuff has popped up to kind of get a, a, a full picture of where it has all dispersed to. Yeah. So that'll be live come February. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of it's still local, which is sort of interesting. It is. It's down yeah. the street at the coffee shop. Right. Oh, I know. I know. Right. Um, yeah. And I, and I don't, I wonder, you know, why that is too. Maybe if, if a politician lived in St. Paul, it maybe it was easier to transport or something. I don't know. Just take it down the road a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So did you have a question? Okay. Same. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you all for, for listening. I hope, like I said, has anybody been to the Capitol since the restoration? Because I, I can't encourage you enough to go. I, I'm not from Minnesota, actually, so um, I, I, I didn't take, you know, the fourth or fifth grade field trip to the Capitol. So, but even still, seeing the, the building after the restoration, it is truly stunning. Um, it, they, they, like I said, four and a half million dollars was what covered the art restoration, and it was entirely worthwhile, honestly. They've uncovered, you know, years, decades of dust and grime from all of the paintings, all of the murals, and so it just bursts with color. I never thought, you know, like a stately old building could, could be so colorful, but between the murals and then all the different um, types of stone, the, of the columns and the staircases, it's just so full of color and cool furniture, so. Did they do restoration of the furniture as part of the restoration of the building? Yes, yes, yeah, and that was, um, so another, another, Point, maybe I should have mentioned is that when 
that inventory was done in the late 80s, they not only canvassed the, the Capitol itself, but other state government buildings immediately surrounding it um, because offices had moved and they had built you know, the Senate building, the Judicial Building to, to accommodate um, growing needs and staff changes and that sort of thing. So uh, they have documentation of where all of this stuff was, not just in the Capitol, not just the exact office in the Capitol, but where um, within that little campus. Uh, so the goal of this restoration was, yes, even to bring more of it back, you know, kind of take it back from where it had dispersed so locally. Um, yes, and then it was all beautifully restored. So, yeah. it's, it's hard to tell some of the reproductions from the originals now. <laughs> it's like that. But yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you all so much. I appreciate your time. Thanks. And keep an eye on the Casco Work Society. So, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. <laughs>